All right. We uh, just got done talking about how uh, there were a lot of people that were that were against separation. In fact, there were more people that were against separating than there were for it. Again, I, I keep mentioning this, but it's it's really important is that it's a minority movement. So here, here's some statistics and looking at how many people were loyalists. If you were a loyalist, also known as the Tory, you were loyal to the British crown. About 20% of Americans were loyalists. Uh, they remained loyal to the king. They were the outspoken group. That doesn't count how many were quietly loyalist. Where you found the loyalists the most were in the South. Anywhere where you had the Anglican church, which is the South. Uh, we know how close the ties were between the South and the mother country from way back Jamestown, slow moving, meandering rivers. It, la it lasted for generations and generations. They were least no numerous in New England. This is where the, the Revolutionary War is being fought up there in Massachusetts. They have fast moving rivers. So there's not a history of close ties between the mother country and New England. We know that. We've talked about it before. So loyalists made up approximately 20%. Uh, they're going to lose their land and they're going to be drawn. Uh, they're going to be auctioning the land off, as you can see in this sketch right here. The other group would be patriots. Um, the patriots were also known as Whigs because the Whig party in England is the party that opposes the king. That's why they oftentimes call themselves Whigs. They were most numerous where Presbyterianism and Congregationalism flourished. Presbyterians were Scots-Irish. Scots-Irish hated the English. So out in the frontier, Congregationalists were old Puritans. They didn't like the Anglican church. So New England, you found them a lot. Um, patriots were younger. They were, they were the liberal, more liberal groups as opposed to the conservatives. Uh, people like Patrick Henry, give me liber liberty or give me death speech. Um, he here's the deal though, like almost anything in life, you could break it down to the one third rule. One third of the people were patriots. One third of the people were loyalists or had loyalist feelings. And one third of the people could care less. I mean, that's the way it is in life. There were just those people who were hardworking, they farmed and it didn't really affect them very much. So they didn't care. So the one third rule usually prevails in almost everything in life. So let's talk now, let's shift over to, to back to the battlefield. The, uh, the Battle of Long Island, or also known as the Battle of New York, is going to be fought in July and August of 1776. England made a decision to come back and take New York. And that was what George Washington predicted when after evacuation day, when the British left Boston, people celebrated, but George Washington said, I don't think this is going to, this is the end. I don't think we have won this war. I think they will come back. And my guess is, and this is George Washington talking, that they would come back at New York and try to take that, that uh, harbor. And because as I've said, they could take over any harbor they want. So they picked, they did pick New York. Uh, Washington gambled and he was correct. So he took the majority of his forces and he put, brought them uh, to New York. Washington had approximately 20,000 men at his disposal there in New York. He thought he was in pretty good shape. Well, the British used a little bit of psychological warfare. And what I mean by that is they had a ship that would come and wait in the harbor. Washington and his men got all keyed up, ready for a fight, and nothing would happen. The next day, another ship would come loaded with men. So they stayed out in the harbor. They didn't come ashore, and they waited. And this happened for a month. Ships were coming in daily. The numbers were going up. They were, the men, the red, uh, Redcoats were staying out in their ships. Washington and his men were tense, and it's hard to be tense. It's exhausting to be tense for an entire month, not knowing when this attack is going to happen. When the attack actually did happen, in July of 1776, Washington and his men were exhausted, and they were also facing horrible numbers. 32,000 British troops landed at New York versus Washington and his 20,000 men and put them on the defensive right away and pushed them back. And Washington 
had to make a decision after a while is do I dig in and fight them and risk losing the entire continental army, the brand new continental army, or do I strategically retreat? That is in Washington's vocabulary. You know, George Washington strategically retreated from the battle of Fort Duquesne and he's going to do the same thing here. Only the, the difference here is that the Redcoats weren't going to let him retreat. He is going to have to go North first and then South to try to get away from the uh, Continental Army. And uh, you could see here the Battle of Long Island and you could see the arrows. If you look at the arrows up in this area here, Washington and his men go North being chased by the British. At a certain point though, it started to get colder in October of 1776. Now, understand this, that the British don't fight in the wintertime. A British gentleman never fights in cold weather or when, uh, when wintertime hits. But who they did have chase after Washington and his men is the Hessians, the hired soldiers. So uh, the British told the Hessians, look, we need you to follow Washington and his men. Don't engage in battle. And uh, just if anything happens and they start looking like they're going to attack, send messengers to us. In the meantime, the British decided they were going to spend their winter in November and December in New York and, and just enjoy life in New York. And that's what the Redcoats did. They took over the best houses. They, uh, you know, went to the bars and went to parties, danced with women from New York and, you know, had girlfriends from, from New York, the whole thing. They enjoyed themselves during the winter. In the meantime, Washington and his men positioned themselves on the uh, southern side of the Delaware River, right down here where the arrow is at the bottom of the map. They situated themselves there. And basically, Washington and his men were licking their wounds. 20,000 men was down to about 10,000 men. They lost half their men in the Battle of New York. So things aren't great. And when they tell you that George Washington and his men didn't have shoes on their feet, well, George Washington did, but a lot of his men did not. Because think about it, even if you have a great pair of shoes today in 2020 and Nikes or, you know, whatever, you're, or any, any kind of shoes, if you are walking in the wintertime or the summertime, you're crossing over rivers, your shoes are getting wet, it's then starts snowing. You can imagine what your shoes would look like by the time you got to the bottom back you down here to the Delaware River they'd be falling off your feet and the shoes back then the boots that they were wearing were a lot worse than we get today so it is true that Washington and his men were wrapping blankets and jackets around their feet so they wouldn't get frostbite and they they were situated here in the Delaware River just trying to survive to fight another day it is definitely the low point at this at so far for the Continental Army they the, the other thing about that, too, is the enlistments for these men were up on December 31st. And how many of these men really wanted to continue to fight after what happened at New York? Half the men are dead. The other half are ready to quit. Washington had to pull off some kind of miracle to get this done, and he's going to do it. First of all, he read uh, an essay written by, once again, Thomas Paine, the author of Common Sense. He sent, Thomas Paine wrote an inspirational piece and he sent it to George Washington to read to the men. George Washington did. So it was a motivational speech. It was a motivational essay that he read. Here's part of it. It says, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Those inspirational words, basically what he's saying here in these inspirational words is, hey, be tough. The, the, the men that are fighting are tough and not the summer sol sunshine patriot, the summer soldier, those that only fight in good weather. Hey, if you stick with this, everybody will appreciate you. And I'm not saying that this was the reason why people are going to re-enlist. They need more than inspirational words. They need actions. They need victory. A victory would go a long way in uh, getting people to sign up again. 
I'll talk about the two phases. The two phases, basically, you know, where, where the war was fought. This is a, um, I really like this map right here that shows you all the different areas uh, where the fighting has occurred. And, uh, you know, obviously we're talking, talking about New York and this uh, red arrow right here is Washington, his retreat and the Delaware rivers right here. And this is where Washington was. Washington had to pull off a miracle and he did. It happened technically on December 26th of uh, 1776 when Washington and his men decided to cross the Delaware and attack the Hessians. Um, to, Washington took about, took about half of his troops in the middle of the night on, on Christmas night. They, the, the other side of the, the Hessians were located on the north side of the Delaware River. Washington was on the southern side. They could see each other across the river. It's about a mile across. And all the Hessians were doing was watching and not engaging in battle. Washington decided, hey, this is what we're going we're gonna to take half our troops. We're going we're gonna to send them up north. There's, I'll come back to that in a minute. He took his men from, they were down in this area. And he takes his men and they walk very quietly on December 25th, Christmas night, walk to up here. He hired a bunch of people to ferry them across the Delaware River. And the ones that were there waited right in this area here on the north uh, side of the Delaware for everybody to come. And then they were going to travel down. They were going to walk the mile or so down back to Trenton and attack the Hessians here uh, at daybreak. So it had to be just really quiet, top secret. Um, they left fires burning over here and half the men so that the Hessians wouldn't be alerted by the other half that were up here. And then they quietly got everybody across this river, the starting at, at uh, 10 o'clock at night and just continued to ferry people all the way over until four o'clock in the morning. Uh, and then at four o'clock in the morning, they started walking down really quietly and and surprise attacked the Hessians and the Hessians had no clue what's going to happen. This is an Emanuel Lutz uh, painting of, of Washington crossing the Delaware, a very dramatic uh, picture here of men and horses uh, being uh, going across the Delaware. And, and it looks like it's day, but it's really night when they're crossing. There was no light at all. And obviously the river was frozen, not totally frozen, but it was really cold at that time as it would in December. It would probably be fully um, frozen if they waited another couple weeks. So they crossed it at the right time and they came across and they surprised attacked the, and defeated the Hessians and took a number of prisoners of war, which they uh, ended up taking back to, uh, to a prisoner of war camp that they had. And, uh, and they were able to, to uh, surprise the, this, the Hessian group, the Battle of Trenton. And then a couple uh, days later, another Hessian group met them at Princeton. So they call it the Washington's twin miracles that happened um, and that allowed for more people to sign up. Didn't allow, it, it encouraged people to sign up and uh, motivated them, I should say, to sign up for another uh, tour of duty instead of just everybody having to go home on the 31st. It really got people fired up and excited and they, they knew that they have a chance now to win this thing. Well, the British tried to get down to business and after this and said, man, we have to have a better, a better uh, plan. So they came up with a three prong plan to take the Hudson river. Um, the British were going to do this. They were going to have general Burgoyne come uh, down Lake Champlain route from Canada. They were going to have general Howe come up from uh, new up the uh, uh, river to Albany, up the Hudson river to Albany and attack. And they were going to have a third, a group coming from what what would be the West, led by Colonel Barry St. Lejeur, and they were all going to fight their way to um, Albany, New York. So this this shows it right here. The plan the plan would be for Burgoyne to come out of here, out of Canada, fight his way down to Albany, for St. Lejeur to leave Montreal, come down the St. Lawrence River, and then come around from the West and fight his way to Albany, and then uh, in New York, where General Howe had the Redcoats, they were supposed to go up the uh, river, up the Hudson River right here, and fight their way all the way to Albany. And the thought process was if the British could take Albany, they'd be able to split the colonies in two, the northern colonies up here, southern and middle colonies down here, and that that would lead to victory. That was their plan. Let me tell you this, none of the three made it to Albany, New York. 
First of all, St. Lejeur gets beaten back here. Uh, and how about this? General Howe makes a decision on his own and says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go take Philadelphia instead. I think that would be more strategic than taking Albany on his own. Going to get fired for it in subordination totally. You could see the dotted line here is the route that he took to take Philadelphia. No one knew that he wasn't going to be there. Not that anybody got there anyway. But here's the biggest thing that came out of uh, – out of this is General Burgoyne, as he comes down, is attacked at a, at a place called Saratoga in New York by a group of militia, a group of New Hampshire militia, I believe, that surrounded him. And even though that Burgoyne had more troops, he was defeated, strategically defeated, that he was outflanked by the militia, and they got Burgoyne to surrender. That becomes one of the, if not the biggest victory for the American militia. It wasn't even the Continental Army that fought here. It was the militia. It was big, really big, because at the end of the day, the French heard about that. And the French, there's General Howe right there who made the blunder and gets fired. The French decide, huh, maybe the Americans do have a chance to win. Maybe they do. Maybe they, they, they could defeat the British. And that's when they made their decision to get in an alliance with the Americans. They call it the Franco-American Alliance, and they backed us with men, with supplies, with gunpowder, with generals. They were all in. They made the decision to go all in. And as I said before, they didn't want to back, they didn't get involved in the beginning because they didn't want to back a loser. They thought the Americans had no chance to beat the British. Once the Americans won at Saratoga, that was, the, that was what got the, the French to be all in. And it, and it was the turning point of the Revolutionary War. With the help of the French now, the Americans had a chance. There's Burgoyne surrenders to General Gates and the militia right there. Just because things got better, just because it was a turning point, doesn't mean that this war was going to be over. They still had a, a ways to go. And Washington and his men went into winter quarters in this winter of 1777, the very next year after the crossing of the Delaware and all that. And they went into winter quarters in, in Pennsylvania. Why Pennsylvania? Well, the Redcoats were still in uh, Philadelphia, which is located in Pennsylvania. At Valley Forge, I've been there before, it's, a, it's on a high plateau and you could look down and you could actually see Philadelphia. That's probably about a 15 to 20 minute, maybe a little bit more drive from Valley Forge to uh, Philadelphia. You could sit up top there, look down and see Philadelphia. You could really see it now because you could see the skyscrapers and high rises there. But Washington and his men were again at another low point. Um, they were tired. They were worn out. This war had been going on since 1775, really. And uh, the men were just there to try to, to wait out the winter time. Well, Washington came up with a plan that he was going to have his troops ready to go once winter ended um, and spring hit. So he hired a guy by the name of uh, Friedrich von Steuben, who uh, was a, a well-known, successful general from Prussia. He was a drill master. Washington realized his um, deficiencies as a, a, a general. He, he wasn't really good at training troops. So he, he, he brought people in who could do that. That wasn't Washington's strength. It was von Steuben's strength. Interesting side note, too, um, he was, uh, General von Steuben was gay. And he was not, I don't think he was, uh, he was out of the closet gay, but, but later on historians know that, that he was. So played a huge role um, in, in our history. Um, so yeah, uh, successful contribution by him training the troops at Valley Forge. By the time the troops were ready to go after the winter ended, because of von Steuben's efforts, um, they were more of a fighting force. And coming out of winter quarters, um, we'll talk about. I'll talk a little bit later about General Benedict Arnold and what happened with him. But uh, the theater of operation switched from the. Um, from the north and middle colony, more middle colonies to the south, because the British said, okay, we're, we're going we're gonna to go take Charleston, South Carolina, and we're going to start fighting in the south because we don't have to worry about militia down there because we have a lot of loyalist friends in that area. 
So they decided to go down, take Charleston, which they successfully did, and then engage in battle in the South. <laughs> what they didn't expect was the fact that in the South, there were militia there. Uh, the Swamp Fox, Francis Marion in South Carolina, um, and a host of others that uh, fought bravely. And it was, they were fighting to a draw down in the South in, in the, the last part of this war. But a, a draw favored the Americans more uh, than it did the uh, British. Now, the Battle of Yorktown is the last battle that fought. I know I'm jumping, I'm going pretty quickly through this, and I'll, I'll you know, crystallize it a little bit more in class. But Yorktown was a, 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 a town on the coast. General... Um, Cornwallis, who was in charge of the British troops in the South, knew that he needed more men and more supplies. And he sent a messenger to the coast to send to Canada, which the British were in control of, to say, we need more men and we need more supplies. Meet us at Yorktown. And it gave the date. What happened was that the Americans captured that messenger. So they knew about they knew when the, the British were going to arrive. They knew that Cornwallis and his men were going to meet the ships there to pick up the men. And Washington took it upon himself to plan uh, to be there also, you know, along with some of the French generals, General uh, Rochambeau, Washington and his men. Uh, and then they alerted the uh, French Navy that was down in the West Indies and uh, uh, they were supposed to meet up. Admiral de Grasse was going to take the French Navy and they were going to come up. And bottom line is this, to make a long story short, and I'll expand on this in class, they were able to trick Cornwallis. They surrounded him and Cornwallis had no idea that the ships were not going to arrive with men and supplies because the messenger was intercepted by the Americans. They surrounded Cornwallis and got him to surrender uh, in spite of the fact that they, the, they still could continue to fight. But because of circumstances and because of how clever Washington was and the outflanking of the uh, Redcoats at Yorktown, the wet white flag was waved and the war was technically over. And not a lot of people accepted that in Great Britain, including the king, but they were forced to. Here is a, uh, a painting, a John Trumbull painting. Of, it's titled The Surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown. However, Cornwallis didn't show up for this. It's, he, he said, I'm sick and didn't show up. He just didn't want to face defeat. Uh, and this is where the sword was passed over from. The, red, the Redcoats had to hand over their sword to George Washington. Interesting little story I'll talk about in class about that ceremony also. But that John Trumbull painting says it all. Here's another painting right here in the maneuvering before the treaty. This is a painting by Benjamin West. Um, it's, not, it's incomplete because the British refused to sit for the painting. Uh, they lost and they didn't want to sit for the painting, so no, no surprise there. But Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay were sent to Paris uh, with the hopes of negotiating a peace treaty. And they will eventually, but the American, uh, the Second Continental Congress told them, hey, check with the French every step of the way, let them know what's going on, in which these three men said, screw that, we're not going to talk about the French, we're going to negotiate this on our own. They didn't want the French to be involved in it. And they, ha they hammered out a peace treaty known as the P Treaty of Paris of 1783. And this was now the United States. Great Britain had acknowledged the United States as free and independent. The, the um, boundaries were north to Canada, west of the Mississippi River, south to Florida. The, uh, Florida was giving, given back to Spain uh, for claim to land over, over uh, near uh, New Orleans. I'll expand on that in class also. Uh, and then the United States was allowed to retain fishing rights off Newfoundland. Congress promised to, here's an important statement, recommend that Loyalist property be returned to them. Um, to recommend that only. Uh, but that never happened. Uh, and then the other thing was the Mississippi River was supposed to remain open to both the United States and Great Britain, which that's going to cause a problem as well. But here you go. Here is the United States after the Treaty of Paris of 1783 and after the victory in the Revolutionary War. Uh, women in the war, a lot. We'll, we'll talk a lot about, you know, women's, women's issues when it came to the war. But uh, women ran farms, businesses, and families during the war. 
uh, some women uh, supported the troops. They would oftentimes they would dress up as men and go and uh, and fight. Um, also, uh, Molly Pitcher is is someone who would bring pitchers of water and actually help load cannons um, during the war. Abigail Adams wrote to to uh, John Adams and gave him information about the home front and women's contributions to that. So women played a big role and women are gonna play a big role after the revolution as well. And we'll start getting into that in the next chapter. Loyalist like William Franklin here, who was Benjamin Franklin's son. Benjamin Franklin and William Franklin uh, never saw eye to eye. He was, Benjamin Franklin was a patriot. William Franklin being the governor of New Jersey was a, a loyalist and they they uh, parted ways and never spoke to each other again the rest of their lives so a pretty sad story again remind me and I'll expand on that in class uh, but 60,000 of the loyalists left and joined the British Army um, they went to Canada they went to England they had their property taken from them and think about this for a minute when it comes economically phew, I mean they that's a lot of you know plantation owners huge plantations a lot of the plantation owners were loyalists so they lost all their property that's going to have a big effect on, on uh, life post post-war so yeah interesting interesting chapter there and again i've got a couple things to expand on in class remind me about the uh benedict arnold situation as well